Our job in this video is to make sense of how blood pressure is generated and maintained and lost in the arterial system especially, but also in the venous system. And then to look a little bit at how we, the body can control the blood pressure. So here we go. So because blood is a liquid, it can't be compressed. So that means that, you know, like imagine if you had a balloon filled with water um, and you tried to squeeze on it, then what would happen is not that, that you could make the balloon smaller. You know, if, if we had a, a, a balloon filled with air, you could squeeze on it and the, you could make the balloon smaller. You know, you, you would take that balloon up to a higher elevation and the balloon would be a smaller thing. But if you did that with, with a balloon filled with water, it wouldn't, it, it can't be compressed. You can't make it squalor, smaller. So when you squeeze on it, it would squirt out rather than being compressed into a smaller volume. So if we have a closed system, like the, the, the circulatory system is a closed system, then when we squeeze on the blood in one location, then it's going to be moved to another location. And because there's always pressure differentials, so pressures are different in different locations in the cardiovascular system, then when we squeeze on the blood, it moves from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. So if we think about, say, the systemic circulation, so the systemic circulation starts here in the left ventricle. So when the left ventricle squeezes, it produces a high blood pressure zone there at the heart of about 120 milligrams, uh, millimeters mercury. So we get about 120 there at the aorta. And that pushes blood from the ventricles into the aorta and it pushes blood toward regions of lower pressure. So as we, you know, and, and this doesn't show the aorta with all the branches off, you know, branching here and then branching again, but each time there's a branch in the arterial system, the blood pressure gets divided between the two branches. Or so, so every time we, you know, so this is 120 if we have an equal size division. So here, say, at, down at the um, iliac arteries, then blood pressure is divided equally between the two iliac arteries. So each one takes 60 millimeters blood pressure. So the further that we get away from the heart, the lower and lower the blood pressure becomes. And so when we get and we've already talked a little bit about this, but here at the arterial side of a capillary network, then blood pressure is about 35 millimeters mercury. And by the time we get to the far side of the capillary network, it's about 16 millimeters mercury. And by the time we get back up here to the inferior and the superior vena cava dumping into the uh, right atrium, then it's about two millimeters mercury of pressure. So we're constantly moving from the moving the blood from regions of high pressure, 120 to maybe 60 at a branch point to 35 here at the capillary network to 16 to two. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Blood pressure moves water or fluids from high pressure to low pressure and um, all the way along, you know, it's tempting. A lot of students without thinking it through would suggest that it's the capillaries where blood pressure is the lowest, but that wouldn't work. If that was, if that was the lowest blood pressure, then all the blood would be flowing toward the capillaries and would never make it back to the heart. All right. So that's blood pressure. So in the arterial system, how do we measure and keep up with blood pressure? Because knowing blood pressure it tells us a lot about health. So the most frequently measured place is at the brachial artery there in the upper, upper arm. But uh, they have little wrist 
uh, blood pressure measures. There's you can you can put it around the 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 cat the upper calf, um, and and so there there are two blood pressures that we keep track of, which is the peak pressure that the ventricles generate during systole, about 120 millimeters mercury, and the minimum pressure that the ventric ventricles generate, which is about 180 millimeters mercury. And so the pulse is that alternate expansion of the artery arterial walls as the ventricles dilate with the pressure, and then the recoil of the arterial walls as the pressure then, um, you know, as, as the pressure eases and the, the, the elastic fibers of the arter arterial walls kind of cause the, the artery to snap back into its um, usual size. So it's that expansion recoil, expansion recoil, expansion recoil that we're measuring when we're measuring um, pulse. And pulse pressure then, and I don't have this in your notes, but it's a good thing to think of, pulse pressure, is the difference between systolic pressure and diastolic pressure. So if a person has 120 over 80 blood pressure, then the pulse pressure would be 40 millimeters mercury. The difference between the systolic and diastolic pressures. And so pulse pressure is felt until we get to the end of the arterioles. There is that cycling between low high, low high, low high. Now, you get less and less difference in pulse pressure the further you get from the heart. Um, and, and so as we're getting into the arterioles, there's very little oscillation in blood pressure. And then by the time we get to the capillaries, it's an even flow rather than a pulse of blood going. And as we said, on the venous side here, pulse, uh, the blood pressure has dropped to about 16 millimeters of mercury. And here we are at the small veins. It's getting lower, maybe, you know, maybe down here to seven or so in large veins. And to the vena cava, it gets down to about two millimeters of mercury. So hypertension then, or high blood pressure, is consistently elevated arterial blood pressures. And high blood pressure has lots of negative consequences on the heart function and on vessel function. So think especially out there in the capillary networks where there's no connective tissue to help support and protect the um, capillaries from damage, then those tiny little inter cell, uh, the inter Oh shoot! Interest the uh, I can't think of the name of it, but you know what I'm talking about. The little gaps between the cells, the intercellular channels. There we are. That's the name of it. Those intercellular channels can get ripped open and wider because of the the damage that additional blood pressure can cause there. So folks with high blood pressure will eventually see some. You know, they could see renal failure as the uh, capillaries get ripped open. Anywhere that there's a dense collection of capillary networks, then there can be damage because of high blood pressure. And at the arterial side, because they are, those arteries are, are facing a lot of stretch from, all that, from the additional pressure high blood pressure causes, then it can damage the walls of the arteries as well and, and increase the risk of an aneurysm, a blowout in the arterial wall. Okay, so where does blood pressure come from then? What is it that when we think about blood pressure, what are the factors that influence blood pressure? Well, cardiac output is a major factor that influences blood pressure. Cardiac output is the amount of blood that we pump out of the ventricles every minute. And there are two components to cardiac output. The first is stroke volume. That's the amount of that's the ejection, the, the amount of blood that's ejected from the ventricles. So stroke volume is how much blood do we push out? And by the way, you should know that um, we don't 
evacuate 100% of the blood from the ventricles when the ventricles go into systole. Um, I think, uh, you know, what's considered normal ejection fraction is somewhere around 60% of the blood being moved out of the ventricles. The other 40% remains in there and, and, and may get moved out with the next, um, the next squeeze of the heart. So stroke volume, the amount of blood that we pump out of the ventricles gives us the amount of blood and the heart rate, the number of times that the ventricles contract every minute helps to turn it into, a, in, into the time uh, factor. So cardiac output is the amount of blood, the stroke volume that we move out, times the number of times the heart contracts during a minute. And so for the average male at rest, that's something like five liters. So we move our entire volume of blood, give or take, of course, um, through, the, through the body uh, with a, every minute. So now here's the part where you want to check in. This is hopefully intuitive to you. But if you increase stroke volume or heart rate, then cardiac output increases. And if we're pumping more blood into the system, then blood pressure also increases. So an increase in cardiac output is going to cause an increase in blood pressure. On the other hand, if we slow down the heart, or if, the, if we reduce the force with which the, the, the heart is contracting, so if we decrease the stroke volume, then blood pressure is going to decrease. So increase cardiac output, you're going to see an increase in blood pressure. Decrease cardiac output, ah, that should be CO, then we see a decrease in blood pressure. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, talk to me. Give me, send me an email and maybe we can come up with some ways. I'll give you a phone call or whatever we need to do to help you um, get that concept into your brain. But, um, but hopefully it makes sense that pushing blood into the system more rapidly, pushing blood into the arteries more rapidly is going to cause an increase in blood pressure. Another factor that can influence the blood pressure is how much blood we have in the system altogether. So that means, you know, if an adult has approximately five liters of blood and there's a hemorrhage and blood is lost from the body, or if we get really dehydrated and, blood is lo and, and we lose blood volume, then we're going to see decrease in blood pressure. So Again, think about the balloon. If the balloon has, is, is filled with water, it has one pressure. But if we remove a portion of the water, say we take out a quarter of that water, then the balloon is going to be a lot floppier and it'll have less pressure in it. And it's the same idea with our closed um, cardiovascular system. Take away some of the blood, the pressure is going to be reduced. So if someone, let's say somebody is, has, has lost a lot of blood, we get them into the, into the ER, the first thing that they're going to want to do is try to increase blood volumes. They're going to push IV fluids and get that blood volume restored. And as blood volume is restored, then blood pressure will also be restored. So decrease blood volume, decrease blood pressure. Increase blood volume, increase blood pressure. So there's the alternative. Let's say, um, let's say you have a, you know, a couple of slices of some yummy country ham and biscuits, and there's a lot of salt in that country ham. And so you increase the osmotic pressure of the blood. That's going to draw fluids into the blood. People get high blood pressure episodes after eating all really salty foods. That's part of the reason why folks with uh, high blood pressure, are, or actually that's the total reason why folks who uh, deal with high blood pressure are encouraged to eat a low sodium diet because all those salts are going to cause an increase in blood pressure, an increase in blood volume, which will cause an increase in blood pressure. Peripheral resistance will also cause blood pressure um, increases and decreases. So 
In order for blood to flow, well, uh, peripheral resistance is a force that opposes the movement of blood. So we have blood flowing through a tube. The blood that's here in the center is flowing with very little friction. Um, but here at the edges, the blood is scraping against the, su the walls of the, of the blood vessels. And this produces friction that slows blood flow. And so we have to generate enough pressure to move blood despite the peripheral resistance it's going to be dragging the blood slowing the flow of the blood um, if we have large blood vessels so let's say all the blood is flowing out through the aorta large blood vessel um, relatively little of the blood because it's such a large vessel is going to be in contact with the wall so there is little peripheral resistance relatively speaking at the aorta but as we get into a bunch of smaller blood vessels, now we have a lot of the blood in contact with the wall of the blood vessel. So this is part of what decreases blood pressure as we divide the blood into smaller and smaller vessels because there is greater peripheral resistance along the pipeline of the blood that the blood's traveling through. There, this also gives us the opportunity to play around a little bit with um, changing the blood pressure. As blood vessels constrict, so now um, here is a vein, and we constrict it and make it smaller, this is going to increase the amount, the surface area of the, um, of the blood that is in contact with the wall of the artery. So de decreasing the size of the blood vessel, vasoconstriction, will slow the flow of blood and cause higher blood pressure. Where vasodilation opens up the, the space, the vein space, it provides greater volume for the blood to flow through, and it also decreases the friction. So when we see vasodilation, then we see va reductions in blood pressure. So vasoconstriction is going to cause higher blood pressure. Vasodilation will decrease blood pressure. Hopefully, again, that's kind of intuitive. But if it's not, we can think about it in some different ways if you let me know that you're struggling with these ideas. And then one of the last characteristics that influences blood pressure is blood viscosity. Blood viscosity is the ease with which the molecules of fluid flow past each other. So here's, some, here's a good example of viscosity. If you think about molasses and water, which of those two has a higher viscosity? And hopefully you said molasses because it you you know you have a pitcher of molasses and you pour that stuff out it takes forever to get all the molasses out because the molasses is sticky and viscous and doesn't flow quickly or easily whereas water or blood has a lower viscosity than say molasses does so the 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 viscosity of the blood can change depending on the number of red blood cells that we see in the blood and the amount of protein that's dissolved in the blood. So increase either of those, we increase viscosity, and as viscosity re increases, it requires more pressure to push it through the vessels. So if you increase viscosity, you're gonna see a concomitant increase in blood pressure. On the other hand, if blood viscosity decreases, then we see a decrease in blood pressure, because the blood moves more easily. We don't have to generate as much pressure to move it. Okay, this leads us then to the last major concept um, related to the control of blood pressure, and that's the Frank Starling Law of the Heart. Now, I thought the first time I saw this, I thought, well, okay, this is some dude named Frank Starling, but no. Turns out we have a dead white dude whose last name is Frank and another dead white dude whose last name is Starling. And so Frank and Starling together came up with the law of the heart. And with a name like the Frank Starling Law of the Heart, 
I always figured, you know, I, it seems like that this should be like a, a really big concept, but I think this also comes across, or, or, or to me always just feels, okay, a little bit intuitive. But it explains how blood flow into and out of the heart is balanced. So if more blood, it, you know, let, let's say we have a volume of blood coming into the ventricles, but we're now working, you know, we're doing something active, and so the, the, the blood is being pumped with a little bit more force. So if additional blood enters the ventricles, then the muscle fibers of the ventricles stretch a little bit more than they would otherwise. When you stretch a cardiac muscle fiber, it automatically increases the, the strength with which that muscle fiber will then contract. So a little bit of stretch to the muscle fiber and we increase the force of the contraction. So what this does then is balances the amount of blood in with the amount of blood that gets pushed out. So if we increase the stroke volume, that is increase the, the amount of blood that the, the, the ventricles push out, increases cardiac output, then what we see is that the heart beats more forcefully and we see an increase in blood pressure. If, on the other hand, the amount of blood that we push into the ventricles is less than normal, then we don't stretch the cardiac muscles uh, as much. That less stretch produces a weaker contraction, and we see a decrease in blood in stroke volume and a decrease in cardiac output that then provides a decrease in blood pressure. So the Frank Star Starling Law of the Heart tells us that whatever blood gets pushed into the ventricles, that same amount, you know, within reason, but you know, the same amount will be pushed back out of the ventricles. It balances the amount, you know, the, the blood coming in with the blood coming going out. And that is all managed by blood pressure. So blood pressure is what pushes out that increased amount when we push in an increased amount of blood. Okay, almost there. One more, one more piece of information about the control of blood pressure, and that is the baroreceptors that are found in the aorta, measuring the blood that's pumped out to the body, and in the carotid arteries. Think about where the carotid arteries are going to. Hopefully you just thought to yourself, oh yeah, heading up to the brain. So we keep track of the blood pressure in the aorta and the carotid arteries. And so these baroreceptors, the, the, the sensory um, endings that are, are noticing blood pressure, have a um, reflexive action that will either decrease blood pressure or increase blood pressure. So if we notice an that um, there's an increase in blood pressure, then the cardiac centers in the medulla oblongata initiate what's referred to as the cardio inhibitor reflex. And this slows the rate of the, of the heartbeat. So we decrease rate, heart rate, and we see a decrease in blood pressure. If on the other hand, these uh, baroreceptors notice that there's a decrease in blood pressure, then we see the cardio accelerator reflex, also from the cardiac centers of the medulla oblongata, that increase heart rate, also working at the SA node. So that's where they have their effect. So here's the heart, here the vessel is leaving the heart. And then up here is the SA node that initiates a um, heartbeat at the atria. So there's a, while it is self-stimulating, we do have nervous control here to either make it go faster or go slower using the cardio accelerator and the cardio inhibitor reflexes. And if we accelerate the heart rate, then we're going to see an increase in blood pressure. All right, so there you've got it. Oh wait, I'm still, I keep thinking I'm at the end here, but I'm not quite there. So we also can control blood pressure by changing peripheral resistance. So the Frank Starling law, law of the heart is how we control blood pressure. That's one way. Cardio acceleration and cardio inhibition 
which is going to change the rate and the force of blood pressure. And then we can adjust peripheral resistance. So control centers, again, in the medulla oblongata will cause vasoconstriction or vasodilation as blood pressure changes. So if we see a sudden increase in blood pressure, so blood pressure is going up, what we'll see in response is dilation of the blood vessels. So blood vessels that were small will become larger. We're going to decrease peripheral resistance. So now this larger, we first have increased the volume of the blood, blood vessels. So that's going to decrease blood, blood pressure. But also because we have less blood in contact with the, the arterial walls, we're going to also see a decrease in peripheral resistance and overall a decrease in blood pressure. If we see a sudden decrease in blood pressure, then vasoconstriction can counteract that because now we're going the opposite direction. By s causing constriction of the blood vessels, we'll see an e a, a decrease in, in volume you know, in space for the blood and an increase in peripheral resistance that increases blood pressure. And chemicals can do that. We, we can do that both with nervous control from the medulla oblongata, but we can also do it with chemicals. Recall that in, um, in capillary networks, if we have low oxygen, high carbon dioxide conditions, so low O2, that's found in active tissues, high CO2 that's found also in active tissue and then we've got this other condition of decreased pH and it turns out that if you dissolve CO2 plus in water so whenever we increase carbon dioxide conditions or the amount of carbon dioxide we produce carbonic acid which causes low pH a decrease in pH so all these things happening which are all conditions of active tissues will cause relaxation, that is dilation of those precapillary sphincters, and ta -da, we move more blood into, um, into blood vessel, into the capillaries, and we see a lowering in blood pressure because there's more space for all that blood to go um, at the arterial side of the, of the, the, the cardiovascular system. Nitric oxide, which is um, a, a gas that is uh, produced out there in capillaries as well. And uh, these, these um, kinds of chemicals called bradykinins, they're released frequently when there's tissue damage. They will cause vasodilation, which will decrease blood pressure. The hormones epinephrine and norepinephrine, they also act as neurotransmitters, so they will cause vasoconstriction, as well as, we haven't talked about angiotensin II yet, but this is uh, produced at the kidneys and is part of controlling blood pressure. So when we get to talking about the urinary system, we'll look at angiotensin one and two. Endothelin is a, um, is a chemical that is released by the endothelium. So all of those will cause vasoconstriction, which will increase blood pressure. So anything that causes vasodilation, nitric oxide, bradykinins, will decrease blood pressure. Anything that causes vasoconstriction will increase blood pressure. Okay, now we are absolutely done with this section. So if you have any questions, you know how to reach me.